Okay, well, uh, we're two minutes past time. I don't want to uh, dip too much into Carrie's time today. Um, first of all, I got to go to a meetup. Um, I just want to shout out uh, Jamarco, and um, I got to see Ronnie there as well. At, uh, the what's the official name of it? Uh, it's just coffee and coding, right? But um, Correct. yeah. It, uh, I'm being corrected. What, what was it? I was just agreeing. Correct. Okay, cool. And um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. And uh, about because I've got a lot of questions about meeting up here at Launch Code. Um, we're still waiting on an official um, building code for people coming in and having study groups here um so as soon as i get that i'd love to have people come in and meet up and go over chapters and stuff like that we just need to get a for sure um kind of protocol for that developed and i think tomorrow i believe they're going to have some more information about that but i'll post that as soon as i get it uh, other than that you might see in Canvas that the um, due date has been pushed back a week for graded assignment one, and that's for the the repo issues that we're having with that. I have went ahead and uh, checked graded assignment two, and that should be published soon. So if you want to check and make sure that you can um, accept that from GitHub Classroom, uh, I encourage you to do so. I didn't have any issues. I don't expect anyone will have any issues with that, but um, better better safe than sorry, right? Um, anything else? I don't oh know. There's one thing I also wanted to talk about. Sorry. Uh, one second. Let me check. Uh, it probably isn't super important, but now I have to make sure. Oh, I guess. Having another Q&A. Q &A. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, so I wanted to have another Q&A about liftoff, um, just because there, there were a few unanswered questions. We didn't have a lot of time to get into it. Um, I think the format is just going to be um, a... 10 or 15 minute presentation and then just Q and A over that. Um, and I'll do that at the beginning of the next catch up uh, day. And that's it. Okay, um, I've got the Kahoot screen back up here. Um, it's your last chance to join um, to get started with everyone else at the beginning here. And we'll get started in just a second. I'm going to test those, uh, test your knowledge of the stuff we talked about in the last class, which I realized was, you know, quite some time ago at this point. But it'll be a good uh, foundation for what we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. If you wanna slip in here at the last second, go ahead. All right, class four. Um, let's see, question one, true or false? All Java classes must have a main method for the program to run. Um, that is actually false um, because you do have to have a main method in one Java class for everything to run, but you don't have to have them in every class. It's a little bit of a tricky question there.
Yep. Okay, here we go. All right. Um, under what circumstances must the this keyword be used to refer to a field from within a Java class? Correct. Uh, only when there is a local variable of the exact same name. Otherwise, it's optional. All right. And Amy goes into the lead. Put these access modifiers in order from least restrictive to most restrictive. You can uh, drag and drop them. Great. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, several of you did really well. So public is the least restrictive um, because you can access it from anywhere, like in the universe, at uh, the known universe anyway. And um, protected, or if you just leave, you know, uh, something off altogether, uh, means that the package, anything in the package, can access it, um, uh, including that class, but nothing outside the package. Private means only things within the same class can access it. All right, NW in the lead. Quiz, which of the following is not related to the concept of encapsulation? Think carefully about this. <laughs> Five seconds. Okay, uh, looks like most of you did really well. So um, yeah, all fields do need to be declared with a type. That's true, but that in and of itself has nothing to do with encapsulation. However, these other three concepts do. So um, the red one, related data and behavior should be kept together in a class. That's part of that concept. Access modifiers should be used to protect fields and methods. That's another part of that concept. You encapsulate a data and you're able to protect some of it and keep it private. Um, getters and setters should be used to retrieve and update values of fields. Same thing. You want um, to control kind of how things have access uh, to and from it. Okay, good. NW retains the lead, but Amy's coming back up there towards the top. Each object created from a class is known as an instance of the class. Revolts. True, 100%. When we say that something is instantiated, um, we're talking about an object that's created based on the pattern that's been defined in a class. Okay. Next question. This is multi-select. Which two things are necessary for Java to recognize that a method is a class constructor?
Good job. So yeah, um, there is no constructor keyword in Java. That's JavaScript. Um, and uh, while it is conventionally uh, appropriate to keep the constructor above all the other methods, that doesn't actually uh, matter. What matters is that it has the exact same name as a class, capitalized, and that it has no return type. That's how it knows that that's the constructor. OK, true or false? Java will assign a default constructor with no parameters if you do not explicitly define a constructor in a class. Okay, that is 100% true. Okay, quiz. What is it called when you create more than one constructor for a class? Great, yeah, overloading. That is it. All right. True or false, an instance method defines additional behavior and can be called on any object that has been created from a class. True. Yeah, and it makes sense, right? Because we, if we say that an object is an instance of a class, then um, an instance method is one that can be called on every single um, on every single object. And tonight we're going to actually talk about the, what the difference is between instance and static methods. Um, and we'll explore that a little more and it'll hopefully become a little clearer. All right, King Goose has jumped into the lead. Must have been fast on that one. All right, last question. Put the sections of a Java class in the correct order by convention. How do we normally order these? Drag and drop. Okay, so I covered this a little bit in lecture last time, um, but yeah, I mean, you'll see, see it kind of in practice as we go through some live coding tonight again. Um, fields go at top, then your constructor, and then any getters and setters for your fields, and then your instance methods would go after that. And there, of course, can be some other things, um, but those are the kind of the four primary things that we've covered so far, and that would be the order you want to put them in. Okay, um, so let's go to the final podium here. Third place, Ian. Great job, Ian. <laughs> oh boy. In second place. And in first place, NW came, came back and took it over. All right. Runners up, Amy and Matt. Great job, guys. All right. Um, well, that was fun. Okay, so let's uh, get right into lecture so we can uh, get you guys to studio, hopefully on time. Tonight, we are talking about classes and objects in a little bit more detail, part two. Uh, let me get the right screen up here. There we go. Okay, so um, Colin covered the announcements pretty much, um, but we'll get into lecture and then have studio and come back for studio review as normal. Um, I did go ahead and put this on the slide. He, he did already mention it. Um, in case you came in late, there is an extended deadline for graded assignment one. It is due next Monday instead of tonight um, because of the issues uh, that um, everyone was having with um, the auto grader or uh, yeah, GitHub Classroom, right? 
Okay, so um, part two, um, we're gonna talk about the final keyword um, that can be placed on um, fields, um, instance versus static, as I mentioned a second ago, uh, how constants work in um, Java, and we'll talk about some special methods um, that belong to Java classes, and then uh, a few more tips on how to maximize the IntelliJ generator when you're working with Java classes. So let's talk about this final keyword. Um, really, all final means is once it has a value, that's it. You can't change it anymore. Um, so it prevents it from being overwritten in the future. But um, strings and primitives, you know, they can't be changed at all. Um, once they're set, they're set. Um, arrays, collections, methods, things like that that are actually like object types, um, they can't be overwritten altogether, but the data inside them can be changed. So um, it's really just about making sure you don't have like an entire list of something completely like, you know, overwritten by another variable or something like that. Um, because you don't ever want to change anything, you would want to have getters, but of course you wouldn't have setters. There's no point, right? Um, so you can declare a final field without initializing it in your list of fields as long as the value is set in the constructor. And then once it's set there, because that's what happens at instanti instantiation, right? It creates this object, it runs that constructor method. And then if you go through and you set the value, then that's the value that's final. And so then after that, it's good, can't be changed anymore. Um, okay, so uh, we've got an example here, you know, uh, book ID, this is something, I'm, I'm basically tonight, I'm, the live coding, I'm gonna take uh, most of what we did last class and build on it. Um, I'm going to you know, change some things up and then do, do some new things. Um, and one of the things we'll do is we'll add an ID to each of the books in the book class. And um, you know, this is a kind of thing where you wouldn't want this to be overwritten once it's assigned. So uh, we could make that final and you know, prevent that from happening. Um, OK, so let's see. Yeah, so that final keyword right there, that's what does it. All right, so let's talk about instance versus static. It is possible to store values um, at the class level and not at the object, like the instance level. So you've already been using instance fields. Every single object will have one of those fields, and but each object might have a different value for it, right? Like in our book um, example here, we've got the title is contact or it's nemesis or it's 1984 and the authors are all different, right? Um, but what if you could have something that um, you could have a single value stored for the entire class um, the independent of all of the objects. So if you look, um, you know, th this would be called a static field. And if you look at this example over here, I've got, you know, class book, and I've got this, uh, you know, uh, new field called next ID num. And if we declare that to be static, that can actually be changed every time something is instantiated and then used to um, apply it to the book IDs. So you'll notice that, you know, down here, we've got these book IDs that are like a combination of the author's initials and the first three letters of the book title. And then on the end, we have a number. And, you know, every time we instantiate something, if we, if we uh, increment that, you know, next ID num that belongs to the class itself as a static field, um, then it stays there and it just waits for you to instantiate something else. And then it applies that number and increments it up again. So it's a great way for you to be able to kind of, you know, handle this sort of situation. I mean, it's useful for other things too, but this is a very, very common one. Um, so we're going to kind of go with this tonight. Um, so you would just use a static keyword, um, apply it when you declare the field. And um, then when you access anything that's static, um, whether it's a field or a method, from outside the class, you call it on the class name, um, not on a specific object of the class, because it doesn't belong to the objects, it belongs to the class, right? And while you can do it, it's better not to. Um, generally speaking, it, you know, it's recommended that you always call it directly on the class so that it's very clear that it's a value that has nothing to do with the objects and it is only something that's stored um, for the class. So we're gonna get more into this in a minute. Um, we're gonna start coding some stuff, but I want to, let's see, oh, oh, there's one more little thing here. Yeah, uh, if you're not sure when a method should be static or not, um, basically for methods, if that method is using instance field values, like 
a title or um, you know the author or something like that that's going to be different for every single object, then it needs to be an instance method because the, the, the result of it is going to be different every single time, right? Um, you'd only want it to be static if it doesn't depend on any specific um, you know, instances and their values. Um, and I will definitely show you an example of that in a bit. Uh, okay, so one last thing to talk about before we go over and we uh, start coding um, a little bit is constants. So this is where static and final kind of come together because um, you might have thought to yourself, oh, well, final is just for constants, right? Well, not exactly. Because truly when you're talking about constants, you're talking about something having the same value no matter what, right? Um, so you might have something that you want to make sure is not ever changed once an object is instantiated, but it can have a different value than another object. But if you've got something that actually just should be the same value no more, like, like pi, right? Pi is 3.14, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's, that's not gonna change no matter what. It has nothing to do with any particular object. You would wanna make that both static and final so that it's stored at the class level and, and it can't be changed. And that's what will actually help you define a constant in Java. Um, so yeah, again, static keyword ensures it's stored at the class level. Final keyword ensures it cannot be changed. You use them together. Um, and then again, um, because it's static, you'd always reference it using the class name and not any particular object of that class. Uh, so in this example here, um, I've got uh, something and we're actually not gonna, we're not gonna code this, but I wanted to represent um, it this way. Um, you know, maybe you have this like, and actually this, uh, yeah. Um, let's say you have this um, <laughs> array. Uh, that just says, you know, here are the three options of what you possibly could have for the different types of formats for your books, right? Um, and you could access it, uh, but you'd want to access it off of the class, not off of any particular book um, of, that you've created. So static, you store it at the class level, final prevents it from being ever changed. So it's always just going to be that array of the, that three things, unless you come in and change the, the hard-coded values. Um, and then uh, when you call it, um, you call it on the class name, not on an object. Uh, okay, so um, let's go over and work on this uh, code for a little bit. And we're gonna kind of run through uh, all of these things, um, this, you know, final, static, and, and constants. Okay, so, ooh, I gotta get, um, get going. I've got a lot of to-dos in here. Um, can everybody read this okay? I can take it up another level if, if uh, speak up now if you if you if you need it to be a little bit bigger. Um, yeah, so we're going to um, you know start off just looking uh, at this book. Um, we talked about how it could be useful to have these IDs, right? These book IDs, and that in order to do that, you'd want to have a class level um, field to keep track of what the next available number is. So we're going to do that. We're going to um, declare this class level uh, field. And uh, I just realized that I don't have my notes up in front of me. Give me just a second, guys. OK. Yeah, so um, so let's, yeah, let's start here. Um, if we say class level, then um, what uh, kind of, you know, and we typically are going to make uh, fields private so we can do that. Um, and this definitely is a, a situation where we wouldn't want this to be changed um, from anywhere else, accessed from anywhere else. Uh, what is the keyword, somebody tell me, that I'm going to use to make sure this is class level and not instance level? Static. Static, yep, good. Okay, and it's an int, um, and then we'll just call it next ID num. And we're gonna initialize it to one so that the very first time something is initialized, it'll get one um, placed onto that ID. Okay, so we've got that, that's great. Um, we're gonna need to manipulate it. So you know, every time we create a new thing, we can increment it up, but we'll get there in a second. For now, let's look at this next one. We've got declare a string field for each uh, unique book ID, but don't initialize it. Um, and it says, make sure each book's ID cannot be changed after it's set in the constructor. So if I'm gonna do that, um, then I'm going to say uh, private and then uh, which keyword do I use to make sure it can't be changed? Final. 
final. Yep. And this is going to be a string because we're going to concatenate some stuff together, uh, like you saw in the example on the slide. And um, again, I'm going to, um, yeah, it's warning me, it may not have been initialized. Nope, you're right, it hasn't. We're not there yet. Okay, but that's the next to do. So let's do that. Um, in the primary constructor, set the book ID, um, but without having a parameter. Uh, we just want it to be done behind the scenes using um, an instance method. And we haven't created that instance method yet that's going to uh, grab that next ID number. And we actually wanna do a little bit of extra work. So we're gonna come down here to um, the instance methods. And uh, there's a to-do here that says, define an instance method to generate a unique book ID. Okay, so how are we doing on time? We're doing okay, all right. Try to decide if I'm going to completely code it or not. Um, so we can come up with this, uh, you know, a, a method here that's gonna actually do the work of putting it all together for us and use all the different pieces that we need. And then it'll be really simple in the constructor to just call that method. Um, so it, here's the notes. Um, it might be hard for you to read because it's in gray, but uh, it says it should be private because we want it to be called only from the constructor. Um, we want to use the format um, author initials dash first three letters of title dash next available number. And then um, all letters should be capitalized. And we want to increment the you know next ID number so that next time a new, new book object is instantiated, it'll have that next number. Um, available to it from that static field. So uh, let's do this. Let's see, we're gonna say private, um, it's gonna return a string, that's what we need. Um, and we're gonna call it generate book ID. Okay, uh, doesn't take any, any uh, sort of arguments. Um, so I'm just going to kind of piece together the ID um, here and say, you know, string ID equals. And I've created to get the initials of each, um, uh, the first letter of each name um, in the author's name. I've actually created a utility class over here called utils.java. And I've got this static method, um, get initials. And all I have to do is give it a full name and it will actually uh, use this thing called a string builder. This is a special class in Java that lets you do the accumulator method really easily um, because it'll, it'll let you, uh, you know, grab the characters, uh, you know, and then uh, append them through a loop one at a time. And then uh, at the end, all you have to do is convert it back to a string. And in our case, we also wanna make it up, uh, up to uppercase for our needs. Um, and then we'll have what we need. So, uh, we're gonna just call this. So if we wanna call get initials and give it the full name from the utils class, um, how, how would I do that? How would I start? By calling the utils class here. Mm -hmm. the and then call the method, right? And then um, it's asking for a full name. And in this case, you know, we're in this class that's going to have, um, you know, the author right there, right? And that's the full name we're looking for. So all I have to do is give it author and we'll have what we need. So we'll do that. We'll concatenate a dash. Um, and then we will uh, say we want the title now. And all we want is a substring of the title. Um, we'll just go from zero to to <laughs> just before three. Okay, why are you being dumb? Sorry, I'm typing and that's what's happening. There we go. Um, <laughs> and then to uppercase um, because we established that was important to us. And then I'll do one more hyphen. And then this is where I'm going to grab next ID num. That this is the class level, the static um, value that will always be different um, every time we instantiate a new object, and it, it'll get apply this unique number to this unique you know combination um, of initials and the first three letters of the book title. And so all we have to do now is um, you know say okay, well we are we're going to return the ID right, but before we do that, we need to make sure to increment uh, next ID num so that the class is now gonna hold the next number. And when we create the next book, it'll have the new number. 
Alexandra? Yeah, I think I just missed it, but um, why did you put the zero comma three in the title that substring? Okay, so that um, this works just like it does in JavaScript, um, where you give it the initial uh, index that you want in the string, and then you give it the index that's just after where you want to end in the string. So if we want the first three letters, we want indices zero, one, and two, right? So we're going to give it zero and three. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah, I know. I glossed right over that, but it does. It works just like it does. Uh, this is one of those methods. It's just like JavaScript. So um, the more you work with these, the easier it is to remember them. <laughs> just keep practicing. Okay, um, so uh, that that gives us this um, generate book ID method that we now can call from the constructor so that when we instantiate a book, um, we will be able to do it. Now, up here, you'll notice that book ID, I kind of listed it in an order where it's in front of all of these. And you might say, oh, well, this, this is just a method. It doesn't really matter what order you do it in. The problem with that is if I put it here, um, it, I can't actually refer to the title and author yet because they haven't been set. So I have to wait until after this dot title and this dot author have been set. And then here I can actually call that um, generate. Um, so we're gonna say uh, this dot uh, book ID and I really don't even have to use the this, but I will. Um, and we're just gonna say uh, generate book ID and that's it. It'll, it'll go and it'll, now that, now that an author and a title have been established, it's gonna grab those, it's gonna concatenate everything together. It's gonna go up here and get this um, static number from the class, whatever it is at the time and add it on. And then we'll have a unique ID. So uh, this should all work together um, to make this happen. So what we need to do now is go over to the main class and test it out. So um, let's just start by saying, you know, I want to, um, you know, just print, you know, what, what would the first available ID number be? Let's just test that out just to make this, sure this works. So I'll, uh, you know, do uh, system.out.println. And then um, we're going to, again, this is a static field. So we wanna call it on the class, not on any particular thing. And we haven't even instantiated any books yet, right? But even if we had, we wouldn't want to. We'd wanna say just the class book and then say um, next, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I forgot the getters and setters. Aha, this is where it's private. So we can't actually get to it. So let's go back over to book. I knew there were some to do's I was skipping. Yes. So we need um, getters and setters, or, or I'm sorry, just getters for these. Um, okay. So the first one here, we created two things we created the static uh, next ID num, and we also created book ID. For the static one, um, you know, either one of these, I can use the, you know, you can you can right click and go to generate here. You can also, at least on a Mac, I don't know what it is for a PC, um, you can look it up, um, but command, um, that was not it. I did something wrong. Uh, command N <laughs> will actually give you this little menu, a quick menu for generating. Um, so I can say, I want just the getter and I want it for, um, you know, next ID num. Um, and it's going to go ahead and give it to me. And, you know, that's pretty much all I need um, for if I wanted to customize it, I could, I could actually say, you know, the next available because it was just for my information. Um, I don't actually need the number um, for my purposes. The next available ID number is, um, and then, you know, concatenate that or something like that. Um, and that, and if I'm gonna do that, then it, I'm not returning an int anymore. I'm returning a string, so I have to change that. Um, so we can do that. And then for here, um, I can uh, say, I also wanna get her for book ID and this is final. So there's never gonna be a setter for this. Um, so just do um, that. And what happened? Oh, oh, it just put it way down here. I was like, where did it go? Uh, okay, so yeah. And that's just gonna give, give us that book ID, but it gives us access now to these you know, private um, fields that we've uh, created that otherwise we wouldn't be able to access from outside through just regular dot notation. So I can't say, I can't say book dot next number ID, but I can say get next num uh, ID num, yeah. Uh, so let's run this and see what we get here. It'll be the first thing that's up. 
yeah, the next available ID number is one. So it's definitely working. Um, it's giving us, uh, you know, that. So let's see what happens after we've uh, instantiated some of these books. And of course, this is left over from what we did last class. Um, so it says, after instantiating each book object, print its ID number, and then print the next available ID number that's now stored at the class level, the static field. So uh, we'll do this. We will um, just print um, book one. And this is where you know, we, we are accessing a very specific objects. You know, this is a, an instance um, field. Uh, so we're gonna say, uh, get book ID. And um, then we can kind of just copy uh, this down actually. Um, oops, uh, IntelliJ, love you. Okay, back to main, here we go. Um, that's what I get for trying to be expedient. All right, uh, so now we have, yeah, so we're gonna print um, for book one, and then I can do the same thing here for book two, and do the same thing here uh, for book three. So we'll instantiate each book and then print its ID and then uh, find out, hey, hey, what does the class currently have as its next ID number now? Uh, run. Okay. So, um, you know, CS con one, the next available ID number is two. And so then it gets used, you know, uh, for IA NEM two, and then it gets, uh, you know, incremented to three. So every single time we instantiate a new book, that static field is getting incremented that belongs to the class and it's keeping track of where it is. Does that help um, everyone kind of understand how this works with a static field? Does anybody have any questions about that, Mina? Uh, is static field is applicable, uh, um, will be shared by all the objects of the class, right? So it will be common, right? You can, it is, you can, yeah, sharing is one way to look at it um, because you can access it from the individual objects, but it's generally um, recommended that you just access it directly from the class, like I did with, with just book dot get next ID number. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, that is going to, uh, you know, round out um, that. So now we're gonna talk about special methods and then we'll come back and do a little bit more live coding. So let's flip back over here. Let me get my other view up here. Okay, so special methods. There are some built-in uh, methods that are part of um, Java classes. One of them is toString. Um, each class has a toString method by default. Um, you can test it by printing an object of that class to the console. Um, and as you can see from the little example I've got here on the slide, it's not very friendly. All it does is point to the object's location and memory. So, you know, I printed book one uh, in this example, and all I got was class 04.book at 38082 2 d 64 which means nothing, right? You don't find out a title or an author or anything. So generally speaking, it's um, a good idea to have a custom to string method for things like this. Um, and you can actually call to string on the object, but you don't have to. You'll notice that I just printed the, the book uh, by name, like the object, um, and it'll it'll run. So uh, yeah, so we can you know not only get it to uh, include the data that we want from the object, we can also format it however we want. Um, so we can uh, take a look at this in a second. Um, the annotation override, at override, is not all, uh, always required. Um, we haven't talked about uh, um, inheritance yet um, and abstraction and things like that. We're going to um, in soon. But uh, for now, even though it's not required, it's still recommended. So you're going to see me use the um, override an annotation on these. Um, and if you were to use the, you know, um, the generator, IntelliJ generator, you'll see that it applies it as well. Okay, let's let's go do this before we talk about equals because equals is a whole nother thing. Let's just do the two string. So we're gonna look at book again. Um, and I need to go back to my other notes. Okay. Yeah, because I want to do this. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna keep it, I'm gonna keep it pretty simple. Um, 
But uh, yeah, if we come to the special me uh, methods here, um, IntelliJ has done something weird and my to-dos are no longer highlighted. That's wonderful. Okay, so <laughs> right here it says to-do, write a custom two-string method that nicely formats the book data. Um, and it reminds you, know, you to use the override annotation. So let's do that. There it is. Just needed to refresh or something. Okay, uh, so we're gonna do that. We're gonna use at override, and then we're going to uh, declare a public method. It's gonna return a string, and it will be a uh, two string. Uh, gotta give it the, the same name as the default one so that it overrides it, that, you know, just replaces it. Uh, and then I'm gonna return, you know, just a nicely formatted string here. Um, I'm gonna start by, you know, putting an, a new line in there. And then I'm going to, um, reference you know get title and author and then um i will uh put another new line in and um, then i'm gonna put the num pages in there and say plus uh pages uh and then another new line and then we're going to display the book id um so you know this looks a little wonky but if you remember your concatenation it all works out um I just, you know, use these new line characters so that it'll be on multiple lines. Um, and so it'll, it'll list the title and the author, the number of pages and the book ID and nicely format it in the console. Uh, much, much nicer than just having, you know, a location in memory, right? This gives us some actual information about the object. Alexandra? Yeah, so just checking. So since you're declaring or making the custom to string right here, we don't need to name it anything special or anything like that. Just when we refer to to string going forward, it'll automatically do this. Yep, this is that's exactly what it does. It replaces okay. the the built in one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, Thank and you. like like I said, we're not even going to have to call to string. We're just going to print the book, and this is what we'll show because it okay. automatically calls it. Yep. Um, Saran. Uh, yes, ma'am. Can we use this this keyword here? This dot num pages. Oh, you can. Mm -hmm. uh, I just we can don't... use this, right? Yeah. Okay. I just don't need to because um, there's no conflict with a local variable, so it Got it, it. Mm -hmm. it knows that it's referring to the the field for the class. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So now that we've established this, let's go over and test it out. So we'll come over here and you know it says test the two string method of the book class by printing the first book. Um, so all we have to do then is just say, I want to print book one, oops, <laughs> book one, there we go. So let's test it. Okay, so right here we see contact by Carl Sagan, 430 pages. Looks like I accidentally left out a, a space in there, but we can fix that. And then it gives us the ID and you know the actual ID number um, after it. So let's uh, come back over here and fix this. Let's see, pages, what did I do? Oh, I need a space in front of pages. That's what I missed. Yeah, so if I run it again, yeah, that looks better. Now there's a space after 430. Okay, so you know, um, much nicer, right? Um, it's a much better presentation, it gives us the actual data we're looking for about the object. And all I had to do uh, was just override the default method and then just print the object itself. And that's what we get. So that's how that works. All right, uh, the last one to talk about here is um, equals. And this gets a little uh, uh, more involved um, because uh, there's a lot of things you have to think about when you're uh, talking about equality, um, particularly when it comes to uh, objects. Um, so again, by default, every Java class has an equals method, but it doesn't actually check equality, it checks identity. It looks, um, compares the object's locations and memory. So it's no better than using the double equal operator. It essentially is checking for the same thing. Um, so if you wanna actually compare equality in terms of you know, deep equality, are the contents of the object the same as the contents of the other object? Um, this is where you want to customize the equals method so that you can provide the exact logic that you want to, what basis you want to compare it on to decide, is this thing the same as this other thing, um, without it actually having to be literally identically the same thing in memory. Um, it can actually be two completely different uh, objects, but have the same contents. 
So um, you can see this example here. Uh, we're we're going to kind of do this in a second. You know, um, are the two libraries identical? If you use the double equal sign, you're going to get false. Um, if you use the dot equals without customizing it, you're also going to get false in this case. But once we customize it, it'll be true. But there's a couple more things to talk about before we go and we actually code this out. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I had one more bullet in point. I'm like, why did this not move on? Uh, override. Again, we're going to use override. OK, so here's the thing about equals. Um, the argument is actually like a generic object type. Um, and in your textbook, they call it to be compared. I think that's a perfectly good kind of generic name for it because you want to kind of start out with the assumption that you have no idea what's being passed in here. Um, and so we're going to have to check for a lot of things um, and we're not going to assume that it's necessarily uh, actually being compared to another object of the same class. Um, so it's generically an object. And then inside the method, you use parentheses to cast. This is called casting. Um, to um, make it a uh, actual, um, you know, like type it as part of that class. So in this example, you can kind of see I've got, you know, the start of a custom equals method here. And we've got this generic object to be compared that's being passed in. Um, so then when I get to the part where I'm casting it, uh, which ultimately will not be the first thing we do, but this is what I'm talking about right now. Um, I will just establish a new variable um, that actually is of the type library, right? And then cast it um, using parentheses here to, to be compared, to convert it essentially. That's, that's what's happening there. And if that successfully happens, um, then uh, it will now, you know, you can use other library and start comparing all the things inside it as you need to. But this is kind of an important uh, step that has to be done. But even before you do that, there's some things you have to watch out for. So we're going to talk about those. Uh, every equals method um, needs extra checks. So, um, you know, early returns, um, just in case you run into a few things that would say, oh, we actually know this is going to be true or this is going to be false already. We can go ahead and, you know, not even get to the part where we're doing the custom logic. So um, the first thing is reference. <laughs> are they actually the same object in memory? Sure. If they are, then true. Yes, they are equal. Um, did something get not actually get passed in? Was it actually null when you tried to pass something into this um, equals method? If so, then there's no point. In we can't compare anything. So let's just return false. Um, is it actually of a different class? If so, we're not going to be able to cast it. It's going to be pretty much impossible. So we just need to go ahead and return false. You want to catch all these things up front before you actually cast it and do the custom logic. Um, so with that, all of that in mind, let's go over and actually do this step by step. Mina, you have a question again? Uh, yes, Gary. Uh, is the other library an object or a variable which will be storing the to be compared uh, type caster, the library class? Yeah, the idea is that you're going to have two different library instances and you're going to be comparing one against the other. Oh, so the other library is an object, right? Object of the library class. Yes. Okay, got it. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it, the, it'll make more sense. You know, this, I, I think I mentioned this last class or the class before, we're kind of at the point where I can't put a lot of code on the slides because there's just too much. <laughs> like, we really just kind of have to get into the code. And I will, you know, if any of you who have ever downloaded the PDFs of my slides will know that when you actually get the PDFs, there are a lot more slides in here that I'm not actually putting up on the screen right now. And they have screenshots and sometimes little explanations of things. And of course, also the links to the code so that you can go and explore this for yourself. So um, I'm gonna you know, live code it, but uh, you will also have the opportunity to investigate it more later um, using these resources. Okay, so we're gonna come over to um, uh, library. And we're going to actually, uh, well, actually, let's go first and, um, you know, just show how this works, right? So um, if we actually use the strict equality operator to compare the identities, um, like we could, you know, print, um, oh, I haven't created the second, I, I can't do this yet because I haven't created the second library. That's okay. We'll do this, we'll do all of this in a minute. Okay, let's go over to the library. Let's actually just go ahead and code it. Uh, yeah, let's do it. So um, 
it says write a custom equals method to compare the content of the books that are inside a library. Okay, so what if you think about it, what we're really interested in here is um, like conceptually, we have a list of books that belongs to this library. And if we give the same, um, the same books uh, or book titles, let's, we wanna make sure we have a copy of the same books in both libraries. Um, we can compare them on the title and the author. That's really all we're interested in. Um, and if both libraries have the same list of books by title and author only, then we're gonna consider them equal. We don't care about the book ID uh, for this for this purpose. Um, you know, we don't care about what format it is. One could be hardcover, one could be, you know, whatever. All these different things, we don't care. So um, this is where we need something custom. And uh, we're gonna have to, you know, uh, create a second library to compare, which is what we were, I was just, you know, realizing. But uh, let's just do this part first. So you, it says use the override annotation. Uh, include a reference check, a null check, a class check, and then make sure you cast it to the library class. Um, and I've referenced the chapter where you can see this. There's actually, if you guys haven't done the reading or you haven't looked at it recently, go back and reread this section, chapter 5.3. It's really, really helpful to uh, to kind of walk you through, um, you know, all the stuff that we're doing. Um, and then before we actually do some, you know, custom, like look through all the books and make sure that they're all the same, um, and kind of loop through them, compare the size. If one book, one library has four books and then one has three, then we might as well just say, whoop, faults, they're not equal, right? So kind of have to think these things through. Um, you know, sometimes there's other things you might think of that say, oh, I, I'm immediately going to know these things are not equal if this is true or if this is, you know, false or whatever. So we're gonna kind of go through a series of these things and that'll help us uh, ultimately catch some of these cases where we might have, um, you know, situations that would immediately, you know, render them uh, definitely, you know, the same or, or definitely not the same. Okay, so uh, let me get my notes here. Let's do it. Okay, so again, override, um, we want that annotation on top. Um, and this is going to, you know, be Boolean. It's going to return true or false and uh, equals. And again, um, you know, like I said, this is object to be compared. It's generic. Um, we aren't checking for a, a type or a class yet um, because it might be null. It might be the same thing. We don't know. Okay, so first we do the reference check. Um, and we'll say if this, and that just refers to the current object, right? Um, if it's uh, literally the identical, you know, in memory um, copy of to be compared, then all we have to do is return true. We already know that they're the same. So that takes care of that situation. Next situation is null check. What happens if we pass in something that's actually not, um, doesn't have any value? Um, so we just check for null. If to be compared has been passed in as null, um, then we would return false immediately and we don't need to continue on. If, uh, no, this is the class check. Okay, so if, and um, there's a method you can call to get, uh, to just get the class on an object. Um, so we'll just say if get class uh, for the current object and if it's not equal to um, to be compared dot get class. So if the classes of these two objects are not the same, we wanna return false and move forward because there's no way we'll be able to cast it, right? Um, but if we get to this point and everything looks good, um, we can go ahead and cast. So now we will say, um, you know, we want it to be uh, of type library. We're gonna call it other library, just to be clear that it's the one that we're comparing. Um, and I'm gonna use parentheses to cast it to the library class. And then this is the thing that I'm casting to be compared, the thing that was passed in. Um, and once that's done, now we can use this other library to, um, you know, work with the getters and setters um, and any, you know, any of the methods that belong to a library object uh, and fields. So um, we can uh, say if uh, books got size. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I forgot about this. Um, this is the uh, compare the size check. Um, 
check size of lists, we'll say book lists. So <laughs> if the size of books um, is not equal to other library dot, uh, dot books dot size, and let me double check here and make sure the top. Um, yeah, I have a to do here that we haven't done. So um, we want to ensure that books cannot be overwritten by another object. Um, so again, that's where we're going to add uh, final. But we also want to make books available to the package. So I'm going to take private off so that it's actually available outside the class. And that way, in the, down here, we can actually refer directly to books. Um, when we just books, you know, other library dot books dot size, I can call, you know, call or, or access that with dot notation directly off of other library because it's now been made available. Um, okay, uh, and I can do that from anywhere. So if, um, let's see, if books dot size, then uh, we would say we want to return false because if they're not the same size, then clearly. Um, one of them has books that the other one doesn't have. Then we can do a custom comparison. Okay. And we are almost done. This is the last bit. Uh, so I'm going to loop through and I'm going to say, I'm going to look at each book in the books um, um, array list. And um, I'm going to look up. Okay. So uh, here's another uh, thing I introduced that's new from last class. I introduced this find book um, down here. We can actually look at it, it's right down here. Find book, a uh, little helper method for us that will go and if it has the title author, it'll go through the books and actually um, find the book that has the same title and author and return, uh, return um, what the index is. And if it returns negative one, then we know it doesn't exist. So all we really have to do for this is just uh, check and see if, um, you know, call this method and check and see if it exists. And uh, let's see, make sure I guess, yeah. So we're gonna pass in the title of the book, um, the title of the book, book.getTitle, and then we're gonna pass in book.getAuthor um, from the original book. Um, that we're looping through here in the original object um, that we've called the equals method on. And then um, it's, but it's looking for it in the other library. And once we've done that, I feel like I have a mismatch. I guess it's just, yeah, just complaining because I didn't have my semicolon on there yet. <laughs> okay. Um, and then all we have to do is say, if index is, um, you know, equal to negative one, return false. And so as it loops through, it's going to look for each one of the books that it finds in this uh, list of books. And it, as long as it finds it, it'll skip this and it'll keep going and looping and looping. But the minute that it comes across this, it's going to do this early return. And then we'll know that the whole thing that it's not equal and it'll just exit out. But if it's gotten past that point, it goes through the whole thing and it did not, you know, find a single book. Um, different, then we are good and we can return true. And I actually just realized that there's uh, a, uh, nope, nope, never mind. I was going to say something that is absolutely not true and lead you astray. I'm sorry about that. Okay. I stopped myself just in time. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's not really a big deal, but uh, yeah, so that that's it. Um, so I know this is, seems like a lot and it kind of is, but there's a method to the madness, right? Um, there's a very distinct pattern here. You know, do they have the same identity? It, is the thing that's been passed in null? Does it have the same class? If so, go ahead and cast it. And then if you have some other thing that you can think of, of, hey, this is another way I could tell immediately that these things are not the same, go ahead and do it. And then do your custom comparison. In this case, you know, I can't just compare the books directly. They're both array lists, which means they're objects, which means, you know, strict equality doesn't work. So I have to actually dig deeper and that's where I'm going in and I'm actually comparing the titles and authors and that's how I'm telling. And if I get all the way through that and they're all the same, then it'll return true. So now that I've done that and we have this custom equals, let's go back over to main and we will uh, create a new library and add some books with the exact same information as the other books, but they'll have their own IDs and stuff. Um, and then we will uh, essentially, um, be ready to uh, 
test this out and see if we can get it to return true um, as actually being like, you know, equal on the basis of the contents and not on the basis of identity. Okay, so I wanna go back over to here. Right, yeah, this will be easy. So I can actually just kind of copy uh, this um, for, oh, I need to, I need, well, for here, but I need to create um, library two, library two, library two, library two, but we're gonna actually create new books. So I need to do that too. Uh, let me just copy this whole thing. Get this all sorted out here. All right. I'm not going to print uh, all the intermediary stuff. I'm just going to have the three books, but I'm going to call them books four, five, and six, just to differentiate. Four, five, and six. But they have the exact same information as books one, two, and three, right? And then um, here, I will make sure that those are the ones that are added to library two. And we will compare library one against library two. So um, this is where I was going to you know, test this out. If we do it with the um, you know, double equals operator um, and say, you know, is library uh, one equal to library two um, and we run it, um, it you know, are the two libraries identical? They are um, not, so that's false. But here's where we can test our equals. Um, we can actually say, you know, li library equals, and then give it library two. And now that we've written our custom thing, if we've done it right, it should return true. Yeah, it's true. Um, you know, and if I did wanna go back and uh, like, like what's, uh, oh yeah, print available books. Let's just uh, show that um, this library too has, uh, you know, the information that, yeah. So library one, library two, they're exactly the same, you know, titles and authors, but they do have different, um, you know, different ID numbers. I could like borrow, you know, this from here and add it to one of these books. Let's see. Let's just say, uh, give us the book ID of book um, six. And there we go. It's, uh, you know, GO198-6. So that, you know, that doesn't have the same ID number, but that's because we customized our equals to, to make sure we were not doing it on the basis of the ID number. We're doing it just on the basis of the title and author. That's all we cared about, right? Um, okay, so that's pretty much that. Um, the last things to talk about uh, here, I can get back to the right, there we go, is just um, about these, you know, generator and IntelliJ. Um, you know, constructor generators will let you choose which fields you wanna use as parameters. Um, getters and setters, you've already seen, we did that last time and a little bit today. Um, and then special methods, there's there's generators for two string, there's a, a generator for equals and, um, comes packaged up with something else that you probably don't need, you can just delete. But I honestly prefer to write the equals from scratch because um, it's very abstract and it usually still isn't what you need if, you're, if your object is complex enough, like in the case of library. Um, so essentially the rule is just don't ever assume that the automatically generated method is what you need. <laughs> um, always make sure it really is what you need and you're probably gonna need to make, make some changes. Not so much with getters and setters, unless there really is something custom you know you wanna do. Um, and not necessarily with constructors, but definitely for two string and equals, you're probably gonna wanna customize your, you know, customize it to your heart's content. But you can, you can use the generator as a starting point and it can make things a little bit faster. Okay, um, tonight for studio, uh, you're going to continue with your restaurant menu project from the last class. Uh, again, don't start with the code. Um, you're going to, you know, it's you're going to find out some more instructions from the owner. Like this is kind of what I'm looking for, and you're going to continue to design um, not only the methods um, for your menu and menu item classes, but you're also going to have a restaurant class that's going to have a main method so that you can run a program and make use of the objects you're creating um, from the menu and menu item classes. Um, so start, start with the design. And then when you feel like you've got what you think you want, 
then go over to your code and add to your code, but you're going to continue, you know, building on what you, where you left off from last time. So um, that is not, yeah, here we go. I meant to have this up, sorry. Yeah, so few, a few more um, details, um, you know, got a list of instance methods that you may need here. Whoa. Uh, and yeah, how, how to, a way to add and remove menu, menu items from the menu, a way to tell if a menu item is new, how to tell if it was last updated um, or when it was last updated, sorry. Uh, a way to print out a single menu item and a way to print out an entire menu. So uh, that would be, you know, I'm thinking, you know, custom to string methods, right? Um, and a way to determine whether or not two menu items are equal. So, um, you know, consider, you know, do I ever have anything that should be static? Do I have, you know, anything that should be final? I mean, think through uh, all of these things as you're kind of, you know, enhancing what you already did and building on it. And then you can put it together and kind of see how it goes. There's a bonus mission down here. If a user tries to add an item that's already on the menu, print a message that, message that warns the user about the duplicate and prevent the duplicate from being added to the menu. Um, so if you get that far, uh, you can add that on as well. But we will come back here at um, eight o'clock. I think we're gonna need the entire thing. So eight o'clock for um, studio review. So I will see you guys then.